Welcome to the Manufacturing Challenges, Finding the Balance Between Design, Materials, and Production webinar. This is a digi conference um, sponsored by uh, healthmanagement.org and also sponsored by 3M Medical Materials, Technologies, Medical Solutions Division. We're really glad you're here with us today for this really exciting conference. As we start, I'd like to thank healthmanagement.org. Please reference them often to stay up to date on trends and initiatives in the healthcare industry. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, 3M Medical Materials and Technologies and the Medical Solutions Division. You can find them at www.3m.com and www.findmyadhesive.com. I'm your host, Tom Hickey, and I'm excited that our presenters today are Matthew Hurley, an application engineer at 3M, and Dr. Maggie Trabaca, an application development specialist at 3M. You know, in my role as a partner at Accelerant Consulting and host of MedTech Gurus, I speak to many entrepreneurs and companies looking to launch new technologies. When starting out on a new medical device development project, manufacturing can feel like it's way off in the distance. However, the sooner you start thinking about manufacturing's potential implications, the more robust your design will be. Your team needs to balance considerations posed by device design, material choice, and production process. The device requirements, which are set by the products and use will help determine the cap capability of your process and ultimately select the best manufacturing process. So with this in mind, I'd like to bring in our two expert presenters today, uh, Matthew Hurley and Dr. Maggie Trebaca. Matthew is a subject matter expert for 3M stick to skin adhesives, microfluidics and device construction adhesives. He provides comprehensive technical expertise in PSA and microfluidics in support of the EMEA 3M MedTech team. He also helps leverages, leverage 3M's science and our medical industry expertise and broad technology portfolios to help bring in the next generation of medical devices to life. Also, um, Dr. Maggie Trebaca is a 3M Medical Materials and Technologies Application Development Specialist. She has a PhD in chemistry, and Dr. Trebaca has over 15 years of experience at 3M analytical method development, product development, and application development involving transdermal drug delivery, inhalation drug delivery, and medical adhesives. Dr. Trebaca currently supports 3M Medical Materials and Technology businesses as an application development specialist. So this morning, we're gonna start off with Matthew. Matthew, we're gonna turn it over to you and uh, we're excited to hear your presentation. Thanks, Tom. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody on the call. So I'm just gonna share my screen and uh, hopefully you're gonna start seeing it coming through. So I'm just going to talk about key manufacturing considerations, uh, just an overview here on this first slide, and we'll dig into some more of the detail as we go through. So just some of the key really considerations we want you guys to think about as we go through this webinar, things about uh, considerations about where to manufacture, plans for your device's next iteration as you work through generation one and beyond, managing material partners, and then ensuring material compatibility with all the layers of your device looking at regulating the material effects and anticipating changes as well as before and after sterilization should that be required in your device. Manufacturing development costs and things beyond that. So just drilling down into some more of the detail really, uh, I guess one of the first questions really to consider is, is where do you decide to manufacture? That question may be an insourcing or an outsourcing option. And some of the considerations, whether you choose to insource or outsource, I guess one of the first one is, do you have the equipment that could fulfill the process requirements of the device you're trying to manufacture? Does the equipment have the capability uh, and, and are your processes robust enough to deal with that? Do you have the capacity needed with the current equipment or do you need to purchase additional equipment? In, uh, an important consideration, cost. And can you meet the commercialization timelines with the resources you have 
do you need to bring in expertise or other resources to meet those timelines? And do you already have the expertise and experience in house? Can you achieve what you want to achieve with the people on your staff or do you need to reach out for further expertise? And should things go wrong, do you have the ability to troubleshoot when problems arise? Is that expertise again in-house or, or, or do you need to go and seek it from elsewhere? And as I mentioned on the first slide, looking beyond the first iteration of your device, looking at generations two, three and beyond, will you need to redesign any device you're developing and produce subsequent generations? What do those generations look like? And more importantly, what do those processes and manufacturing processes look like? If you need to purchase equipment now for generation one and have it built to a specific process, does your de design requirement specification make it possible to use it again? You want the best value out of the investment you're making. Have you considered existing processes and scale up for the next iteration? What do they look like? And what is the timeline for the next generation's development scale up? Is it one year? Is it two years? Or is it further and further out beyond that? And when you're looking at manufacturing, obviously managing several material partners, multiple material suppliers and manufacturing partners will add complexity to the communication. What are the processes to ensure that all the partners within your development processes receive timely updates throughout the entire project. Some development may be small scale, some may be a lot bigger and require much more complexity. And if a change, change, sorry, and if a material change occurs, how does that affect your documentation, the verification and the validation of your processes? What processes are there with your material suppliers to deal with change management? Should something happening, be, something be changing earlier on in the supply chain? And ensuring device material compatibility, obviously the more complex the device, the more risk of compatibility issues. Devices constructed with incompatible materials can fall apart prematurely and perform unexpectedly. Obviously not ideal. Does the device have multiple layers? Each layer needs to be compatible with those on either side of it, and also has to be compatible with your manufacturing processes. The material com compatibility is determined by the layers of the mechanical, mechan the layers mechanical and chemical properties need to be considered. And are there potential sources contamination from one layer to the next? So migration studies and leachable studies need to be considered also. So those are a few slides from me and, and a few little considerations from me, but what I'm gonna, now gonna do is I'm gonna hand it over to Maggie. So Maggie can start talking about the material effects. We are talking about regulating material effects. So um, as uh, Matt already mentioned, um, it is possible that materials react with one another um, and also possible that certain materials just do not work with one another in the actual manufacturing process. So that is something which definitely needs to be considered during the development of your device. Um, and uh, you need to make sure that you determine what your critical materials are and whether it's possible to exchange one material for another, for example, um, should that not work in your process as expected. Um, and very important in that as well is to understand variability within your manufacturing process. Um, a process means you've got lots of moving parts, including the incoming material has variability um, and your process itself has variability. So you need to make sure that you can actually reliably manufacture your device um, repeatably in a very robust process. Um, and be clear on which part of this process and which of these materials are critical to the final product, to the, to the end product you actually want to bring to market. Once you are there, once you've decided on all those different input materials, 
you want to build a number of these uh, to test whether your desired manufacturing process is actually really attuned to all those materials and you can do that including all the variability of your materials coming into the process. So as Matthew already alluded to, um, there are potential changes um, when you treat your finished product, for example, um, by sterilizing it, because uh, these medical devices are very often used in a hospital setting where it's then necessary to sterilize those medical devices. Um, they're used on open skin. So, um, again, it's required to sterilize the device. Um, therefore, you need to make sure that you assess the impact of sterilization on your finished device, not just on each material going into the device, but what does it do to the finished device as well? And a lot of um, versions are possible there. So you can gamma sterilize, E-beam or ETO sterilize. And all of these kill bugs, but gamma and E-beam, for example, it's, it's high energy radiation. So you can actually uh, cause uh, cross-linking um, in, in your um, adhesives, which makes them a lot harder. Um, polypropylene can get brittle um, and um, the effects like that needs, need to be assessed whether they have an impact on uh, the final functioning and quality of the device you are finally bringing to market. So make sure that you've ticked, or, uh, ticked all the boxes and um, are not all of a sudden surprised at the, at the end of your development road um, and you think hmm okay this all worked fine up until the point when I, start, uh, when I started to sterilize so so think about that early on uh, that you're not faced with a situation that you have to potentially swap out the material at the very end before you want to commercialize. Something which is always very, very tricky and um, it's, it's probably one of the hardest balances to strike is managing the development cost. Because um, if you have an awful lot of money to throw uh, at things, uh, that makes life a whole lot easier. But you need to think about what are the very important bits where I really need to make sure I've got the funds to spend to uh, be confident that I have a well-functioning device at the end of the day. And the main balance you want to hit there is between cost and quality. So cost and quality doesn't automatically mean, uh, well, uh, you, you, you have to um, spend an awful lot and that way you will always get top quality. You need to focus on the right parameters and the right parameters, the most important parameters are very much dependent on your device. So um, you, you want to develop a very robust and reliable manufacturing process to make sure that you have um, very high yields. And sometimes this robust process is achieved by not taking the cheapest input material, but going for a medium to high cost input material, but you know it's reliably functioning in your process, so it gives you a very high yield. Um, yield is not that obvious on the balance sheet as the cost of an input material is, but at the end of the day, if you always have to throw away half of your finished product because the variability in your input material is so um, yeah, not properly controlled, then you're not really winning anything. anything. So um, watch out for, for this hidden cost. Um, then 
top priorities, be clear on your top priorities. Um, what is really the important feature for your device to function? Um, is it a, a, a fancy add-on or is it something which is really essential to your device? Then we've got navigating global implications. So global um, implications is particularly um, in the current climate. Um, well, you, you do know about supply chain security and um, supply chain security over the past few months has been quite stretched. Um, and that was even with uh, countries in a very um, or supposedly stable environment. So um, make sure that uh, you're sourcing materials uh, from countries where you know um, about the geopolitical, uh, are they geopolitically stable or not, for example. So to make sure that, that you actually do have a constant supply, a supply you can plan with, um, and at the other end as well, uh, the countries where you intend to sell, um, are you sure you can sell wherever you, you target the market or are there certain tariffs you have to think about? Um, and um, uh, are there potentially assumptions that you're not allowed into certain geographies? Um, also, where you want to sell has an impact on the studies you actually need to perform on your medical device because you want to make sure that your material uh, your device functions um, whether it's at the arctic circle or somewhere in a tropical resort so it's temperature humidity all of this you need to consider um, during your development where you actually want to sell your device as well. And finally, obviously, you want to um, manufacture not just on a small um, process development line, but you want to scale up your manufacture that you have um, Lots of devices you manufacture in a short period of time uh, with high yields. So learn what you can from the smaller process development lines and, and uh, from building prototypes. But do not assume that you can transfer the process you use during uh, your process development um, on a prototype line that you can transfer those one-to-one -to, -one to a large scale manufacturing line. So test your assumptions all the way along. The, the, the more you learn on your process develop, in your process development, the better you are um, or the better your position is at the end when you want to scale up because uh, you already know the parameters which are very important on your pilot line. Uh, so you can very tar uh, create very targeted experiments to find out, well, do the same parameters control my process in exactly the same way or in a slightly different way on a larger line? Um, and once you've, you've tested that, uh, test that scale up process with multiple lots of input material. Uh, run a DOE, a DOE um, uh, on your large scale process um, and make sure there is sufficient budget still available to um, go into the detail and carry out investigations if you stumble across something um, which you can't explain or you don't understand in your process because uh, it very much pays at the end of the day when you know your process and you know which dial to turn 
to get a process back into control. And with that, I really would like to uh, open it up to the, the panel. So um, if you would like to get in touch with Matthew or myself, um, our contact details are here um, and we have some uh, resources there as well. Um, confusingly, it's, it's a sort of signs of skin, but there are uh, various different um, resources under that header. So it's, it's a web link which um, gets you to uh, white papers um, and uh, information sheets and um, another resource I would uh, like you to try out is uh, the Find My Adhesive page, which is um, essentially a, a, a web decision tree where you can um, plug in your requirements for your device and uh, it will then offer you a list of um, materials to start off with or to use as a starting point for your development and uh, you can anytime get in touch with us to discuss any um, design requirements or if you would like to try other uh, alternative materials to this. So with that I stop sharing. Okay. Thank you Maggie and um... Before we bring in our esteemed panelists, we did get a question from the audience, and that is, at what point should one engage an adhesive manufacturer when planning a project? I would suggest to you, um, uh, engage an adhesive manufacturer as early on as possible, because uh, already with with the design of your device, you can actually uh, make make life for yourself a lot easier uh, by designing your device in a certain way uh, that makes the manufacturing process a lot easier and gives the device far better chances of surviving for a long time uh, worn on the body um, rather than you develop just a box and then come to us with a box and say well make this stick. So. Yes, yeah, so early collaboration is really important. Gotcha. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel that we have with us today, um, starting with Mr. Lane Shaver. Uh, Lane is a field application engineer at Boyd Corporation. Lane has over 25 years experience as a manufacturing engineer with the last 10 years in the medical converting industry. Lane has worked with numerous companies to help them develop and manufacture adhesive-based skin contact products. He holds a bachelor's degree in uh, mechanical engineering from Tennessee Technology University. Also, we have with us uh, Mr. Kevin Pickett, who is the medical products manager at Marion Incorporated. Having started at Marion uh, Incorporated in 2005 as operations manager, Kevin then led the company's operation in China for two years and is now medical products manager. Prior to joining Marion, he worked as a sales engineer uh, with Amanda America. Kevin got his bachelor's degree in industrial management and engineering from Purdue University. And last but not least, also Mr. Ashley Tweed, who is a research and development project lead at Parafix. Ashley has a broad range of experience in engineering adhesive tapes and flexible materials. During his 10 or 20 years at Parafix, one of Europe's leading converters and distributor of self-adhesives and flexible materials, he has worked with customers in various industries, specializing in medical devices and microfluidic diagnostic devices for the last five years. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. And um, I'd maybe start out with Ashley. Ashley, you know, listening to these presentations, maybe you can give us a, a high-level overview in terms of some of the best practices that you've learned in terms of you know, when to bring in uh, an organization like 3M and, and how that uh, has helped. Hi, uh, yeah. So firstly, thanks, Thomas. Um, I think it's, it's important to bring us in or bring 3M in at the beginning of your planning stage. So you're, um, you're developing what your stack up's gonna be and you're not too sure what you're sticking to what. So getting 3M in, at the start is best practice because you don't want to be sticking a 
uh, non stick to skin adhesive to skin um then 3m were normally they will they, they help you down the line of selecting the adhesive to use um giving you some if you're capable of converting giving you some ideas on how to convert and if you're not putting you in contact with the likes of myself lane or um kevin so that's kind of how it's meant to work gotcha gotcha and Kevin, I'm just going to turn it over to you with the, kind of the same question. You know, what types of best practices have you experienced in your role in, in bringing some of the technologies and development over to, to, to your organization? First, thank you, Thomas, Maggie, Matthew. Uh, just to uh, reiterate what Ashley had said, um, Marion prefers to get involved as early as possible with both the customer and 3M. Uh, as a converter of the flexible materials, and it could be anything from adhesives to uh, single coated tapes, double coated tapes, foams, et cetera. Uh, one of the keys will also be to determine two things. One would be the process materials necessary in order to convert properly in addition to the finished good process, uh, finished good materials of the adhesive. And secondly, one of the things that's often forgotten in the design concept is the release liners of those materials in the design phase. Uh, ideally, you keep the parent liner on the adhesive materials, but as we know in the design phase, it's about user interface with the finished device. So the liners play a critical role with the user, and that's an absolutely critical part of the converting process is matching the proper uh, release liners with the correct adhesives, and 3M also provides uh, variations of release liners uh, uh, with different coatings for different types of adhesives. So again, that's that's a key part of early intervention with the converter, Marion in particular, uh, that we prefer to, to be involved from the onset as early. From there, we go to proof of concept, into prototypes, into small batch manufacturing for clinical trials, <clears throat> all the way through to scale up in mass production, uh, as Maggie alluded uh, the other key part of that is, is managing the quality management system throughout the process. So uh, understanding when we get ready for scale up, one of the key processes through that phase is IQ, OQ, PQ, which is a validation of our manufacturing process and the ability to be able to uh, produce a repeatable and reproducible product for large scale manufacturing. So from Marion's standpoint, early as possible. Got it. Thank you. Perfect. And and now I'll turn it over to Lane at, at Boyd. You know, what types of best practices have, have you learned and uh, with this process? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously echo the same thing where Ashley and uh, Kevin and I are all probably on the same page here is get us involved early. We can help with the design. Uh, my experience um, with 3M, we usually they bring us the, the lead, but then we work with them kind of backwards to pick the right material. So the, the customer needs to understand what they want the adhesive to do. And then we can go to 3M with what we need for manufacturing and they can provide us with a list of materials to choose from. So again, get us involved as early as possible, whoever it is, whatever your converter is, just get them involved as early as possible. Two things, they can help you with your design and help with the material selection. Got it, got it. And then we just got another question from our audience and that is, what is a, re a realistic time frame, you know, from idea to stick on device manufacturing? Um, Matthew, maybe you can start us with that one. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I was I was looking at that question whilst you were talking. Uh, I, I guess my first pushback on that would be is, is depends on the complexity of the device itself. Uh, I mean, some things, if they're fairly simple, uh, will not obviously take as long as something that's more complex with more layers and, and, and a more difficult construction. Uh, I, I guess looking at some of the customers I work with, I, I would say a realistically a realistic time frame from an from an initial idea to manufacturing is probably somewhere to about 12 months uh, again possibly more depending on the complexity possibly slightly less but yeah i i would think i think we're talking in several months rather than than several days certainly 
Yeah, so uh, obviously it takes some time and I'm just kind of curious and, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll offer this to all of our panelists about, you know, as you go through that development process, have you ever run into an aha moment where maybe it changed the whole uh, process with manufacturing to getting to a point where it, it took the product and improved it? And, and maybe Kevin, you, you raise your hand, I'll, I'll start with you. Can you, do you have a story like that? Yeah, it's 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 relative to you know the best laid plans <laughs> will change, uh, and this is where the 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 synergy between uh, uh, we Marion and 3M come in handy. Relative to uh, the design uh, looks favorable on paper, and uh, we have uh, you know we recommend the DFM or design for manufacturing concept. But Maggie alluded to this, and this is very specific. As we get through the clinical trial phase and uh, testing early on for um, certain adhesives. One of the key is with anything skin contact is wear on the body and for how long the device is going to be worn. Uh, the skin substrate varies by, by patient. Uh, all of us on this webinar have a different skin concept. So a different skin makeup. So the adhesive is going to work on some of us uh, better on some and, and uh, not as effective on others. But the Eureka moment in, in a certain incident uh, for a long-term wearable device that we had was that the sterilization that Maggie alluded to actually changed uh, the adhesion properties of the device. So it's a, it's a reaction mode um, at that point to be able to correct that and retest. The other part of that is once we move through that phase is that the, the parts were going to be assembled in an automated facility by our customer or by the, the other device, the, the final uh, contract manufacturer the device. So we needed to design the part so that it would be able to fit through the automated process. And what that required was we, we had to add a carrier tape or another material to be able to carry the adhesive patches through the automation. So that required a whole nother set of engineering, which ideally should happen earlier in the project. So as an example, those two factors had an issue on the materials, but also an issue on the project timeline. Very gotcha. important to understand. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank Very you. good. Mm -hmm. um, Lane and Ashley, um, anything to add to that, or maybe even taking it from a perspective of what types of quality differences do you see in some of the adhesives, which uh, we've had somebody from our audience ask us that question. So maybe you can kind of tie that together. Uh, well, I would say from my standpoint, uh, we, we, I've done several projects where I was involved from the very beginning. And then you get involved towards the end, as, as Kevin was saying, and it, it does affect the cost of that. Cause a lot of times I have a, a couple of customers that are wearable devices. And a lot of times, you know, all the technology is in the wear is the device, but the adhesive that attaches it to the body is, is perceived as very simple. But if, if we get involved early enough, we can make that where it's not so expensive because a lot of times the design's already done and we have to make a patch that will work with what's already been designed. And that's sometimes can be expensive. So from, from my standpoint, um, we like to get involved as early as possible. And then again, uh, 3M for us, personally, we, we, we do it kind of a 3M gives me the lead and then I take it from there and come back to them and say, this is what we're trying to do. What is the best adhesive for that? So you really, again, got to get the converters involved. I, I'm sure Ashley and Kevin agree, get us involved early enough and we will help uh, design a patch or, or, or a adhesive um, that works for what your process is needing. So Ashley, I'd like to come to you with some of this question, but maybe with a slightly different twist and I, I might put you on the spot here a little bit, but I'm thinking about quality materials, early stage development. And then is there, a, have you ever seen a patient compliance? Does, does one material versus another help from a patient compliance standpoint? In other words, if it's not comfortable or it doesn't stick very well, the patient might not use it as quite as readily. Do you have any experiences that you might share with us uh, along those lines? Uh, not, not along those lines, no. Um, okay. I've got a 
going back to the construction of the product, mm -hmm. it's 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 in, it's important to make sure that what you're constructing in your head is actually manufacturable in the first place. So, like the way you uh, want your liners presented. So, I'm not too sure what the other guys call it, but the um, we call it a double butterfly liner. So it's two folded liners placed next to each other. And um, we had a customer recently that wanted a 0.4 mil thick foam laminated on top of a butterfly liner. Now, anyone knows that as soon as you take the liner off of the foam, it's going to stretch. So we did this for them, made the sample, sent them off, and they they didn't like them um, because they're shrunk, obviously, because you've just taken the liner off. So we went back to them with the option of just putting a slit down the back of it, sent them off, loved it. It's, it's just making something simpler is sometimes better. Just don't fall in love with your product as it is on your screen. You just, it will change. Yeah, that's very good advice. Don't fall in love with it, right, until you get into some scale, right? Because yeah. things can yeah. always, always change. It, yes. It's all, it's all right making 100 parts by hand, but as soon as you start churning out hundreds of thousands, there's, um, there's a huge difference. Yes, for sure. Kevin, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yes, uh, I wanted to actually go back. Those are yeah, Lane and Ashley are exactly right. We, we see this every day. Uh, but the answer about the, the adhesive quality, uh, I wanted to put this out there on 3M's behalf. The key is, uh, first of all, in the testing phase, uh, Maggie, I think you mentioned a uh, design of experiment and testing those adhesives or Matthew early on in the phase. One of the keys is that when you move from proof of concept prototype phase into mass production, that that material has been commercialized. In other words, 3M is able to produce that in volume for your project. And I can't emphasize that enough. One is, is understanding the lead times involved with getting the raw material as you move to mass production, but also that it's been commercialized and proven that when I order a, raw, a, a master roll of raw material for mass production, it's consistent from side to side on the roll. In other words, no matter where I cut that raw material, I'm going to get the same level and quality of adhesive across the entire roll for the entire length of the roll. And that from a manufacturing standpoint, when we're talking mass production and potentially millions of parts a day coming off a machine, that material quality is absolutely essential. And I can assure you that 3M's product, especially those that are already vetted and commercialized as 3M medical adhesives are very, very high quality. That's excellent. Thanks, Kevin. And Maggie, I want to come back to you now, uh, keeping in sight with that patient compliance question. I've got a question uh, from the audience about, you know, what are the best adhesives when it comes to durability and wear time? But I'd also like to add a little complexity because in your presentation, you mentioned some of the global changes. And, you know, our panels brought up some of the things about aging differences. And then globally, we've got ethnicity. So there's a lot of different factors that come into that. So can you give us some background and some advice about what, how do you look at what's the best adhesive to, to use for that durability, wear time, and patient compliance? Yeah, in terms of uh, how to work out what is the best adhesive um, for a very wide patient population, that is a very, very tricky question. I mean, ideally, you have different adhesives for different skin types, as Kevin already mentioned, um, probably between all of us, uh, we have such different skin types that some adhesives will work absolutely fine, others will not work at all. Um, and testing early on, um, what your use case would be. So use case does include the environment and the variability within your patient population. Um, testing that as early on as possible is very important. And um, if you have to, well, in inverted commas, use and abuse your colleagues to stick some skin pa uh, patches on to find out whether they fall off or whether they work, then do that. That's absolutely fine. We are more than happy to supply you with materials to do that. Um, but testing can't be beaten. So um, you, you can sit in front of uh, specification sheets however long you want to 
You can't be sticking something on skin and just trying it out. Um, and in, in that context, so really think very hard about um, now coming to the, the, the global aspect, um, are you using your um, medical device in different geographies? Is it um, feasible or is it cost prohibitive to actually design your medical device in a way that you have an interchangeable skin patch, for example, so that you can cater for different skin types or that you can cater for different geographies? So um, it's, it's um, not necessarily the best choice to always go for the adhesive, which is the strongest, because what you definitely want to prevent is any skin irritation or skin injury caused when you want to remove this patch from the skin and it's still stuck so hard to the skin that you actually damage the skin. So that goes into the compliance. So if, if you have um, an adhesive which is too strong for the application, for example, you take a long-term wear adhesive and put it on a device which is only worn for a couple of days, um, the peel adhesion will be still very, very high and your, your patient population will not like it because it will hurt to take it off. So therefore go for the right adhesive for your application and not just aim for the strongest. So it's, it's, it's really a balancing act. You want to um, strike the balance between sticking too hard, not sticking hard enough, um, temperature implications, sweat implications, uh, probably as well storage implications. So um, if you, manufacture a medical device which you then end up having to transport and store in a temperature controlled way that adds to the cost of your medical device quite dramatically whereas if you manage to strike that balance right and don't need it temperature controlled you are far better off there so um Sorry, it's not a straightforward answer. It's a bit like, well, how long is a piece of string? But um, yeah, you, you have to test along a, a lot of materials and already have your end goal in sight and think about what am I trying to achieve and test all, all those parameters to get all the way there. Yeah, it's clearly not a one size fits all situation, right? And you really no. got to think about where some things are going and, and how to segment your market. But it's a, it's a real question and it's a real challenge. And, and yeah. Matthew, I, I think this question comes more to you. It might be to both you and Maggie. Um, there was a mention that there's no compatible method of sterilization. You know, a product design may have to be re, uh, reconsidered. Isn't that going back to the drawing board and what are the costs involved in the timelines, if any? I'll take that first, Maggie, give you a little bit of a breathing space. Uh, I guess my first comment back to that would be having the conversation earlier on on about the proposed sterilization method. So we keep that front and center as we're having those conversations early on about material selection. Uh, yes, there are issues as you, with some of the sterilization methods, but if we keep that in mind earlier on in the material selection phase, we can hopefully mitigate any of those issues further down the line. Got it. So yeah, and if it comes to having to mitigate, that can actually throw up the uh, timelines for your launch quite dramatically. So. Yeah. Uh, because you, you are essentially going back to the drawing board. Um, if you're lucky, you find the material you can just slip in in place, but that's not necessarily the case. Sorry, Kevin, I was... <laughs> yeah, and no, you're exactly... One of the, and Matthew, you touched on it. One of the keys, though, is for that sterilization. Typically, it's, it's going to be assembled. Uh, ideal, it's likely to, the, the adhesive would be already assembled to the device prior to sterilization. The key is going to be how that is packaged. You package differently for an ethylene oxide sterilization than you do a gamma radi radiation. And that's very important to understand it. The type of pouch that you use or the type of container or uh, uh, be it uh, 
a, a formed lid stock type device all plays a critical part in how that's able to be sterilized. So that's another key factor to understand is how it's packaged prior to sterilization. And we can, we, uh, we can assist with that here at Marion as well. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that um, when you're looking into that, you sh when, when you're starting off, you should be understanding what is your sterilization process and, and start with that. And we, we can select materials or processes. Any of us can, can help with that, um, that, that meet that sterilization. Got it. And, you know, it is, is perhaps as disappointed as it might be when you, you know, perhaps have the wrong uh, process early on, that's much better to discover it in that um, development stage than after you've released the product. So, you know, it can be expensive to back the train up, so to speak, but it's way more expensive if you've already released it to the marketplace, correct? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, and we've had a question about data. Uh, is there any data about adverse reactions and at what stage of product development do you pay attention to this point? Um, and then can you change adhesive composition during product development process, which we already kind of touched on, but is there any data on adverse reactions? And then, you know, maybe to our panel, uh, how, do, how do you track that and, and, you know, how do you communicate that? Sort of general data is available. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure about other uh, adhesive manufacturers, but anything what we have in our medical portfolio has been tested according to the ISO 10993. So, which is essentially a, a biocompatibility testing. So um, you will uh, have a summary report on the adhesive whether um, any skin irritation has been detected um, during this testing and uh, whether it has any shows any reactions uh, with cells um, and that's available to, for all the adhesives. Obviously we can only speak for our adhesive not for the whole combination so um, our biocompatibility gets you so far that you can say, OK, uh, if something um, irritating or, or if we have an adverse reaction, it's most likely not caused by the adhesive. Um, but what happens in the whole stack? And uh, Matt was alluding to that um, during the presentation that you have to consider the interaction of all the different layers within your device. So, um, I mean, make no mistake, when, when you have um, an adhesive and then a very thin polymeric film and something else stuck to the back of it, um, it's not a question of if something migrates, it's when does it come through. So that, that's something um, you should probably test very early on um, of the, if the materials are compatible with one another. But from, from the actual adhesive side, yes, we will supply biocompatibility reports. Got it, got it, thank you for that. And Ashley, I'd like to come back to you because um, as we move through this process now, I'm, I'm curious to find out if there's any unique success stories. You know, we talked about some aha moments, but uh, have you and your team seen any kind of really interesting success stories, you know, coupled with your partnership with 3M and getting to an end result? I, I, you might still be on mute, Ashley. Um. Yeah, so we, we we worked with 3M for a, a long time. <laughs> I'm not too sure how many projects I can talk about. That's that's the problem. Um, there's been a lot, and I think uh, I think we all feel the same way. We're, yeah, I'm not sure how much I, I can I, talk that's about. That's the problem. Uh, gotcha. I can, most of them are all NDA'd, and I can't. I Got can't it. talk. About, I can't talk about. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But 3M have been very helpful, and we we win quite a lot. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, Kevin, let me come to you yeah, in terms of uh, some some interesting conversation yeah. and, and talking points here. I think uh, on behalf of Converse, I can possibly help Ashley and Lane. Um, 
we, we do get this information. The key is though, that we just encourage uh, the owner of the device and the design of the device to test and retest. And then in the clinical phase, get involved with the clinicians that are going to use the device. Uh, the keys that we see with device quality relative to the, uh, uh, the adhesive is that, uh, first of all, for anything skin contact, that it's biocompatible and gone through cytotoxicity testing like Maggie, first and foremost. I wouldn't even consider a material. Oftentimes we look as a cost factor and we have some potential customers ask us to reduce costs by considering an industrial grade material. The answer is no, not for skin contact, at least from my perspective. Sorry. Um, but there's a reason for that. Um, and uh, what, we, what we do is in that testing era, we, we, we suggest we will also confirm testing, but the 3M data is on the, on the uh, technical data sheets provided with the specific raw material is, is uh, very well done and accurate. So um, that eliminates that. But the skin prep, it's, it, it's, it's probably a misnomer to think that there's never going to be an issue with a skin contact device. Some, there will be some anomaly relative to some type of skin substrate that the issue will take. Maggie addressed the other part is if uh, what we ask, and this is, there's a, there's a document called this, the science of skin that 3M has put together. Critical questions to ask at the onset of the project are absolutely uh, understanding the demographics of the, the user of the device. We see more variation in age demographic than anything. So from an infant to an elderly, you have the two very large extremes of skin. Uh, in the infant, it's a very well hydrated, fresh substrate. Uh, on the aged, whatever that means, uh, it's typically a little more dehydrated, a crepey as we, as we call it, and much more susceptible to um, uh, to tearing and ripping if the adhesive is, is removed improperly or, or it's not the right adhesive. So uh, obviously in the demographics, absolutely critical of wear time. The other key is, will the skin be prepared prior to the adhesive being placed on the skin? Will it be uh, cleaned and or shaven? Um, and then uh, what will the consumer be doing or the user be doing while they're wearing the device? Some active, some wearable devices are being worn by some very active people doing certain things. So all those come into play. Um, lastly, the thing we really haven't addressed is relative to the adhesive is the shear strength of the adhesive relative to the device. If you have a very heavy device that you're trying to attach to the skin, you have to have the proper surface area of the adhesive, but most importantly, you have to have the right adhesive adhering the skin patch to the device, if that makes sense. So that that device stays on during an active wear time. Uh, so just to, just to add on to that knowledge, but that, that article, the science of skin produced by 3M is extremely helpful in understanding the skin concept. Thank you, Kevin. That, that's very, very uh, helpful and useful. And as we start to, to wind down with our webinar, I'm kind of curious, um, and Matthew, maybe I'll start with you. You know, what have you seen in terms of some of the gaps now in wearable technologies and, and where, where do we go from here? What, what do you see in the next three to five years in terms of wearables can go? Uh, where, what I'm seeing, uh, and certainly trends I'm, and conversations I'm having with my customers, uh, is, is pushing the envelope now in wear time. So we have our 14 day wear time uh, adhesives within our portfolio. Customers are now looking to go beyond that for medical device applications and cosmetic applications as well. So that's certainly a trend that I'm seeing within the marketplace and questions that are being asked of us. Uh, other technologies, conductive electrodes, I'm being asked about those as well. Uh, and those kind of things as more and more devices, electronic as well, and, and then sensing on the skin directly. So I'm being asked those kind of, those kind of questions and, and, and those kind of capabilities. Thank you. Um, Maggie, anything to add from your end on, on where do we go from here? Um, well, I, I can only chime in with uh, Matthew there um, to say, yeah, wear time is definitely a, a, a big deal. Um, and sort of outside of wearables, 
um, it is um, in vitro diagnostics, so point of care diagnostics. Now with the pandemic, um, everybody is uh, railing for um, the, those and, and, and uh, the, the race is on pretty much. Um, and in addition to that, um, sort of thinking back to wearables, it's a lot of um, uh, vital signs monitoring to have remote monitoring so that you don't have to uh, come either come in direct contact with the patients or that um, it enables uh, enables you uh, to know whether your mother or grandmother is still okay and upright um, even though you are 50 miles down the road so um, those are sort of trends um, uh, particularly now with with the corona pandemic that um, this this remote monitoring has really come on in leaps and bounds and people all of a sudden drop all the um, sort of uh, reserve um, and, and say mm, perhaps it's not such a bad idea and uh, we, we will go there. Yeah. Lane, I'm going to come back to you with that kind of same theme in the sense of, you know, with your team at Boyd, you know, what, what's the future hold without giving away any trade secrets, of course, but, you know, where, where do you see some of the trends coming with, with your team? Yeah, I think it's interesting. This is kind of back to back on uh, 3M, but I, some of our products, we, we see a lot of the customer wants the adhesive to stick really well to the skin for 10 days or 12 days. But when you decide to take it off, it needs to be gentle. You know, so we have had some struggles with that. We have a couple of wearables that we, we make, and that is one of the requests. And I, you know, I, I, from, from the manufacturing engineering side, I, I feel like it's adhesive. It is, it is what it is, but I do think uh, there are some changes that we can do. Maybe um, we've worked with 3M on a, a, a removal process so that they can follow a certain process to make the removal of the adhesive more gentle, even though the, the adhesive doesn't want to remove gentle, but you can do these steps to help with that. So, so I see that, but the, definitely, um, I'm sure the other, other guys, uh, Ash and Kevin have seen this, the wearables are becoming very popular of whatever the wearable is, is intended to do it's becoming very popular. And, you know, I personally have a, a, a friend of mine who has nine kids. I know that's crazy. Um, but seven of them are juvenile diabetics. They're all, they all have diabetes. And so uh, they have been working with other companies uh, along with us uh, to work on a wearable for, for the insulin pump and, and testing. So, it's a big deal, you know, and, and like I said, a couple of, the, like you were saying earlier, a couple of their kids are not sensitive to the adhesive at all, have no issues with it. They can change the site, no problem. Others, it, it, they can't leave it on for a day and it, and it causes problems. So they're working through that. So I would, that, I would say that development of materials, which is what 3M does, and then development of processes of how to treat the material once it's applied are where we're, we're getting a lot of experience. Gotcha. That's, that's great. So um, Kevin, any last words from, from you and your team? Yeah, just to resound what everyone is, uh, has already said, the wearable market is huge. Physiological telemetry uh, is big, uh, which plays into the hand of uh, hospital automation. So nurses can monitor multiple patients in real time. That's a, that's a big segment of wearable devices. Athletics, that's another big, uh, in the sports world, that same telemetry is key as we all have the uh, Apple watches and so forth, uh, monitoring and the, uh, and the uh, Fitbits and everything. Uh, but uh, what we see is the key for all of that, that we run into in all of the projects, literally all of the projects, is when you get to the clinic, clinical phase, it is about the user interface. If the device is designed that is easy for the patient to use, they will likely like the device. If it's difficult and the liners are difficult to come off and it hurts when you take it off, they will 
they will only use the device for a short period of time. The same with the nurses and all of you in this can understand it. <laughs> the feedback from the clinicians is so important because they have to be able to uh, apply the device with gloves on in a clinical setting, either the physician or the, or the nursing staff. And that design relative to someone manipulating it with a pair of gloves on is critical. On the user side, what we're starting to see is, again, make it easy from out of the package onto themselves. Simple, simple, simple is the best recipe. And that's what we recommend from a design from a manufacturing side from Marion. That's what we highly recommend, simple. Simple, love it. Ashley, uh, as, as we wrap up, any final words from, from, from you and your perspective on this? Um, I'm seeing a lot more printed pets with circuitry embedded into it, RFID, um, probably the same as the other guys are seeing, um, registering to the print. Uh, it's good. It's, 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 it's going in a good, good place. Um, it's, uh, we've got hydrogels, conductive hydrogels. It's, there's a lot, a lot of new, new stuff. Wow. That's terrific. Well, as we wrap up, I'd first of all like to thank everybody, uh, all of our presenters today, uh, Lane, Ashley, Kevin, and then uh, Maggie and Matthew. Thank you for some terrific insights. Um, I'd also like to thank you know healthmanagement.org for bringing this to us and 3M Medical Materials and Technologies for sponsoring. Thank you all for really some interesting insights and some great content and uh, all the best uh, as we move into the future.